Thanks for joining us. I'm Dan Hanlon with Midland Trust Company. For those of you that aren't familiar with us, Midland Trust, now part of the Equity Trust family, is a specialized provider of custody services that allows investors to invest their retirement money into privately offered investments. We're very proud to just receive the honor from Forbes magazine as the best IRA custodian for private equity investments. I have with me today, David Olvidencia from Angelus Investors, who's gonna talk more about some changes upcoming to the accredited um, standards of private investments. Welcome, David, tell us more about yourself. Well, Dan, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Uh, a little bit about myself, um, senior technology executive for decades uh, in companies like Oracle, Verizon, Ford Motor Company, Accenture, and then an angel investing career that's been about almost 12, 13 years, been doing angel investing primarily through an organization called Irish Angels. It's a Notre Dame affiliated angel investing group, but also other groups as well. I have a portfolio of about 70 companies I've invested in. Uh, most recently, uh, let's say recently, about three years ago, I co-founded an organization called Angelus Investors that, that you mentioned there. We're now one of the largest and fastest growing angel groups in America uh, with about two, almost 250 members uh, that span the nation, 22 companies we've invested in. Some of the top sponsors in the world uh, are our sponsors. Uh, and it's been a great run. I serve on two boards, uh, and I'm also the author of this book in the background here called Networking Excellence. The work is capitalized because you got to put in the work if you want to be excellent uh, at networking. So that's a little bit about me. It's an honor to be with you, uh, Dan. Yeah, thanks for joining. And you know what we're going to talk about today was something that um, I've I've seen a lot from your LinkedIn feed, and then. Um, in some recent financial publications that I recognized you and your name um, about some changes that might be coming um, for their accreditation standard. So why don't we just start at the, the basics? Like what is an accredited investor? Like what's that mean? There's a, there's a history to it, but in essence, it's a definition that you either have to have a, roughly a million in assets and above, or as an individual, you need to make $200,000 a year or a married couple, three hundred thousand dollars a year. If you hit those those two benchmarks, you 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 can qualify as a, an accredited investor. There's also a couple of things on certifications and you know Series Seven or things for like financial advisors that can also help qualify. But in general, 80, 90 percent of people who qualify for the accredited investors are in that in those first um, couple categories in terms of million in assets or two hundred thousand a year in annual. Uh, uh, income. Uh, okay. So a question that we get from time to time, is it, is there like a certificate that someone needs to apply for? Or is there like something that they get in the mail or like, how does someone know or how to qualify? <laughs> well, you, I mean, <laughs> in general, you, you, you self attest. Sometimes some organizations to really prove you're accredited will maybe do a little bit more, maybe tax returns, financial statements, things like that will ask for a bit more information. Sometimes it's it's very simple. So it, 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 it you know, it depends. But in general, at least from my experience, it's been a self uh, attestation. Uh, and then another question that we get is like, why? Why does this even exist? Is it um, meant to, who's it meant to protect or what is it? What's the history of it? It, 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 there's been a history to it. The, I believe it started roughly around the Great Depression. So the government put that in place to give a, a bit more uh, investor confidence and transparency and create this different class of, of, of investor, but also realizing that some of these private investments, right, there's also going to be a, a level of, of sophistication uh, that's needed there, right? The second part of the history, I think, is in the eight, early 80s where then the government then decided to put in, okay, well, what, 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 what is an accredited investor and then put these different thresholds. But then they, that's when they began to put those wealth and income measurements um, in there. And then, you know, there's a whole conversation of, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of dumb, wealthy people out there. It's right to say, Hey, just cause you're wealthy means yeah. that you're smart and you can make great investments. So it's not necessarily true, but so there's, there's, it's not perfect, but that's, that's what, that's a bit of the history to how it's got to where it is. Uh, today, those who are accredited, right, get access to these different, you know, investment opportunities, funds, and uh, startup companies, etc. Yeah, absolutely. So there's an upcoming potential change 
Are you aware of like when the last time there might have been a significant change to these standards? I believe there is minimal to zero and maybe closer to zero. Okay. Um, but but it, mine would have been maybe adjustments in the it, with inflation, just the, what the accredited level is. I don't think there's been much, if any. And, and I was testifying to the Financial Services Committee, I don't know, six months ago, just around this whole topic of accredited investors and how did what changes do they need to make and all that stuff. And the, you know, a lot of the conversation was, hey, this thing has basically barely changed, right? But th there was a lot, at least a panel, and it was pretty... Um, bipartisan. Now there's a conversation, hey, we should raise, you know, raise it and 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 raise the limit, uh, the wealth limit uh, for people to invest or be accredited. We said, nah, we, you know, a lot, a lot of us in a bipartisan way said, no, we should, we, we should, and there should be a little bit more, um, even more flexibility, if, if you will. So having not changed and since basically it was created, this, you know, could possibly be big news for folks. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about, um, what the change is potentially and the background, like where it came from. And then we'll start talking timeline and that sort of thing. There's been all this startups that have done tremendously well. You look at Facebook, Uber, Airbnb, Google, ShipBob, one that I've invested, all, this, all these uh, uh, startups that have done very well, but they've only been available to this this unique class of accredited investor to come in early. Right now, when they're public, anybody can invest in them. But where you get the outsized returns are when you invest in these companies very early on. And so it's been this kind of stuffy, secret, uh, rich, if you will, club uh, that's that's been the only ones that have been able to access these, these type of opportunities. And... In some ways, you know, some could argue that, hey, this is a high risk, high reward asset class. And by the way, for every Google, Airbnb, Uber, uh, you know, <laughs> that have done well, there's probably a good 10 or so, 15 or so that lose money. So, so it's a very high risk, high reward asset class. So, so what this accredited investor has done is it, it's, it's given uh, those access to these these great deals, high risk, high reward, and so the conversation has been, well, what, why is that, and why can't, why should you be penalized because you're poor? I mean, I didn't grow up with a lot of resources, but you know, I had an, a, a, an MBA from from Notre Dame, and I barely made the the cutoff to be 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 accredited. Uh, and I didn't actually write out, I mean, put on student loan debt and all that stuff in there, right? Yeah. But you can have an MBA from a world leading organization, or you could be very smart, or you can start there's a lot of different things. Why are you penalized for not being wealthy to invest in these opportunities? And so that's where the 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 conversation has been. And the thinking is, well, okay, and you got in a bipartisan way, right? It's like on one side, you want to, this is high risk. You want to make sure that people are protected. Uh, and then on the other side, you want to give access, right? Everybody should be able to access, right? So there, there's two very uh, vital components here, right? On one side, so one of the changes that's happening is they've, I believe they passed uh, in the Congress. And this is kind of interesting, right? Because we're so, it's a bit divided, but this this one was passed like 350 to 13 or something like that. Like an overwhelming majority of Congress passed something. I don't know, it's very yeah. that happens. But, but they did. And, and so this was to create a test that would, that would, um, that people would have to take and pass, uh, to become accredited. Right. So, uh, that passed and then now it's on its way to the Senate and we'll see, and, you know, probably to take, you know, then you got to create the test. And yeah, so it's probably going to work its way over the next you know, couple of years or so. We'll see. Uh, but then the other side is, well, what do we do with the definition of accredited? I mean, so, Hey, so if you want to be accredited, well, the great news is if, if you can prepare, take, and pass the test, right? So on the other side, the question is, well, what do you do with the amount, right? Is a million a right? Is 200,000, right? And can that be, you know, there's a conversation, do we raise that? And then in, the, in, the, in, uh, in Capitol Hill, we were talking about, uh, maybe we, maybe you lowered a little bit, right? So we'll see where those shake out. I, I'm, I'm more, of the, more of the mindset that it should be lowered, um, and I, and I believe 
that you should do in these type of investing in angel groups as part of groups versus like individuals, mm -hmm. because you, at least you're coming in, <laughs> at least you're coming in with the team, right? I mean, it's not like you and or you getting pitched and you doing it individually. At least you do it as a group and you can, you can do the due diligence as a group. You can find the deal as a group and then support the deal as a group, but we'll see, we'll see how that shakes out. But those, so those are the two areas um, I mean, the one is that's already working its way through the legislative process. The other one is still being talked about, Dan. So that's the so just to clarify that the test is working its way. And then the um, the income or the net worth uh, revisions is still on the table being discussed. Is that right? That, that, that's my understanding. OK, but it's nice to hear. I think the main takeaway here is that it's nice to hear that um, I guess maybe for once or once for a long while, the conversation is meant to be maybe less penal or more open up more opportunities for people to make investments. I can think of, you know, how this benefits, um, you know, the investor, um, the in investment managers, um, and small business. Like, who else would this uh, impact uh, in a positive way? I think it impacts the startup community, right? I mean, I think it, so. You know, at a stepping back right we're in a we're in a time period uh of exponential change things like artificial intelligence quantum ar vr what's going on with the human genome and all the advances there um so at, as these opportunities continue to hit our you know come come at us right i think giving more people access to invest in these opportunities early uh will, will help will help the startup community right i think uh, uh, which then, you know, then it has its ripple effects, right? It helps communities, it helps girls, it helps our country from an innovation perspective and growth perspective and leadership uh, perspective. So that, I think that's the, that's a, a big, big driver. Um, I think it also helps improve our investment acumen. So now that people get more access to this, whether you, you know, you pass the test and you, you begin to invest and you can maybe do it earlier if, if this is a route that you want to take, Right. It should also improve our, our investing acumen um, as, as investors as well. Um, and then and, and look, I mean, I think I'm <laughs> I'm over indexed on early stage startups as a percentage of, of my wealth. Um, but I think you know, if done right, done with angel groups, uh, I also think uh, that this it benefits the, the investor, um, because if you look at at early stage, a diversified early stage angel portfolio. Um, and I'm about to ready to do a, a social post on this. You look at two top angel groups over 10 period, 10, 10 year period. Um, it's like 27, 20%, 28% IRR. If you invest, you know, over a period of time uh, in a diversified angel portfolio as a group, um, it's been, and then the angel capital association has some, some um, uh, data on this as well. So it also ben it's also going to uh, benefit the, the the investor as well. So those are the, the three areas of, of benefit, Dan. Perfect. Well, um, stay tuned to our channels. We'll be sure to update you on any any changes. Um, David, thanks for joining us today. Um, to learn more about Onalus Investors, please visit the link that we're going to put up um, onto the screen here shortly. And it, to contact me at Midland Trust, uh, please reach out anytime. Thanks again, J David, for joining us. Thanks, Dan. Great to be with you. Have a good one.